something tonight. And so to kind of catch everybody up, it's been a couple of weeks since we have uh, kind of worked through this series. And this is the third in, in the kind of the, the, the series. And we're talking about renewing our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so in the first, the first lesson we talked about is that the need, why do we need to renew our heart, soul, and mind? Uh, about how the world is always pushing us into its mold, and it wants to, it's it, want, uh, it wants us to believe the things it believes. It wants us to, it wants us to talk the way it talks. It wants us to live the way it lives. And so that's the need that we have is we're under this constant pressure to conform to the world standards. Uh, and then the second one that we talked about was about when we're going out into the world that a lot of times we don't understand why they believe so different than we do. Um, and we talked about Acts chapter 17, about um, that, that people have all these beliefs and they're, they're wanting to hear all these new teaching as long as it isn't about Jesus, right? Um, we're open to anything until you start saying that there's only one way to God, there's only one way to worship, there's only one way to salvation, and then we like, that's not tolerant, we don't want to hear that. And so tonight what we're going to talk about is um, why believing in God is necessary to understand the world the way that it is. And so I want to kind of put that question out there first. Why is a belief in God necessary to understand our world? Why would you think? Okay. Okay, we have hope. Yeah. How, do, how does God help us understand the world? I'm sorry? The beauty of it. Okay, what else? Who created the world? He created it. Since he created it, he controls it. Yeah. So if we accept him, we accept his control. Yes. And, and so that's really one of the parts that we need to look at is if we take God out of the equation, then we take out the creator, the purpose for creation. You know, we don't understand why there is a world, what, what the purpose is to the world, why there are human beings, those kind of things. Now, a lot of people will tell you, hey, listen, I don't have to believe in God to get the same results uh, in the same kind of life that you have. I can be a moral person and not believe in God. I can understand how the world works and not believe in God. I can, you know, live in this world and operate in this world on my own reasoning and my own capacity. I don't need a God. So, so why do we constantly push this idea of we have to have a foundational belief in God to truly understand the world or morality or beauty or any of those kind of things? And that's what we're going to work on tonight. So let's pick up in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they're without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their heart to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So tonight, we really want to seek to answer the question, why is a belief in God necessary to understand the world? Well, the first thing is we have to understand that there's a worldview problem. And this is what Paul is talking about here. Everybody has a worldview. Um, worldviews don't spring up out of nowhere. Everybody believes something. And I want to use a term tonight that you may not have heard before, but we all have. We all have presuppositions. Now, that's a big word, but let me tell you what it means. Presuppositions are things that we just assume to be true. 
It's just the kind of belief system that we have. We just assume it to be true. And these presuppositions impact how we think, they impact how we view the world, and they impact how we interpret evidence. The way that you know that somebody has a presupposition is when you start kind of challenging what they believe, they're not going to listen to what you have to say. Um, you know, there, there are people that I talk to all the time that will say, listen, I would believe in God if you could give me proof. And so then I start asking, well, what kind of proof would be good for me to give you? Well, there is no proof. Okay, well, that doesn't make sense. You said you're open to proof and I'm willing to give you proof. And then you say, but there is no proof. That's a presupposition. They believe there is no proof that they, that they can be given to change their mind that there is a God. And we have to understand everybody has them. And, and, and the thing of it is, you know, there's nothing wrong with having presuppositions. What's wrong is one, when we don't recognize what they are, or two, we like to hide the fact that we have no presuppositions. Uh, what you see this a lot, you see it in science and in media. Uh, what they like to say is we are, un, we are unbiased. You know, we have, we have no bias. We have no presuppositions. We're just going where the truth leads us. And then you start talking to them, and what you find out is, well, they got a lot of bias, right? There's only certain things that can happen in certain ways, and anything outside of that we discount because it's not true. Um, I, I'm reminded of... Um, John Hume, he was a philosopher in France, and uh, he wrote a book called Miracles, and, and really he didn't believe in miracles, and so the whole book was basically this. There's no such thing as miracles, and because there's no such thing as miracles, we throw everything out in the Bible. Jesus wasn't real, all that stuff. Now, right down the road from him, <clears throat> there was a convent where miracles were actually happening, and so they come to him, and they say, hey, what do you do with this? There, people are going there who can't walk, who walk. People are going there who are blind that they see. How do you handle this? And he says, well, because they're not real miracles because I don't believe in miracles. <laughs> you know, it's really this idea of don't confuse me with the facts. I already know what the answer is. He called them anomalies, yeah. And so we all have presuppositions, and they impact the way that we think. They impact the way that we view the world, and they impact how we interpret evidence. Um, you know, so, and I'll be honest, I have presuppositions. My presuppositions are that God created the world. My presuppositions are that God spoke to us clearly in his word. And so when I'm presented evidence that wants to seek to change that or to discredit that, I'm going to have a skeptical view of that already. But I don't mind admitting that presupposition. I'll say that up front. But we all have those. Now, our presuppositions sway what we believe and why we believe it. And I love this quote that I'm about to share with you. I, I just It's the greatest thing ever. Um, here's the thing. We need to understand that when we're talking to people, they have presuppositions that impact how they think, what they believe, how they interpret evidence. It sways them, whether they want to see that or not, understand that or not. And G.K. Chesterton helps us understand this. And here's what he says. When men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. And this is the point. This is the point of what we're trying to get at. Why belief in God is foundation, fundamental to understand the world. Because once you walk away from God, it's not that you don't believe in, it's not that you believe in nothing, it's that you're now open to believe in anything. Anything that comes along that will give you a reason not to believe in God. And you're going to see that in this chapter, and we're going to kind of work through this. Now, the first thing that we see here um, is something that people just really have a hard time with. Look at what it says in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We all have worldviews, and we all have presuppositions that impact the way that we think, the way that we learn, how we interpret evidence. And here's the thing. Here's the scary thing. We are actively, in our sin nature, suppressing the truth that is clear and right in front of us. And so as you hear this, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, that suppression means to hinder, to restrain, or to take control of. Now, here's a lot of things. People want to think that they are bias-free, they're unbiased, you know, that they're just searching after truth. Well, when you start asking those questions, what, tr what truth are you searching after? What evidence will you accept? You know, how, what is informing your conclusions? Well, here's the thing behind it. There's this suppression of the clear truth that God has made known in his creation. And we're going to get to this in just a second. But this question just kind of sticks in my craw, and I have to tell, I have to put it out here for you because this was the thing that got me for a long time. Why would anyone knowingly suppress the truth? Why would anybody knowingly do that? 
It interferes with what they want to believe. It interferes with what they want to do. It interferes with how they want to live, you know? Um, you've probably heard something like this. Well, my truth is, you know, you can believe what you want, but my truth is. I want to speak my truth. I want to live my truth. And so what we're really dealing with when we're trying to renew our heart, soul, and mind is we have to understand kind of hardwired inside of us in our sin nature is this idea that we are going to suppress God's truth. We want to hinder it. We want to restrain it. We want to take control over it. And so why would anybody want to do that? Well, here's the thing. We have struggled with knowingly suppressing the truth of God since the Garden of Eden. That has been the human, common human struggle in every, every nation, every place. It's this commonality of we want what the devil promised. You will be like God, you will not die, and you will know good and evil, right? We have, we have struggled with this. We have struggled with this idea that God has a truth, God has revealed that truth, and we are to respond to that truth. And so the struggle that we have is this, this natural desire to suppress it. And so when we fundamentally walk away from that, or we try to suppress the truth, and this is what we've, what we've dealt with. Now, how, what truth are they supposedly suppressing? It's important to know that. If they're suppressing truth and unrighteousness, we need to know what that truth is. Well, look at verse 19. God's going to tell us what the truth is. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible, attribute, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. So what's the truth that people are suppressing? What was the truth that you suppressed for a long time until God opened your eyes in Christ and changed the way that you think? Number one, God has clearly revealed himself to the universe. You know, there was a long time when I really felt like that this argument uh, that I hear put forth a lot of times that there isn't enough proof to believe in God that used to scare me to death when I was early in my Christian faith because I thought, you know, what, what proof do we have? Well, God's made it clear. God has written his name. God has put his DNA on everything in the universe. He's signed everything, right? This intelligent, intricate design that we have in our universe shows us. And so the first thing that we see, the truth that they try to suppress is that God has clearly revealed himself to the universe. You'll hear people say, well, if God would just speak or if God would just show up, and I'm like, he is speaking right now. Do you see the sun? You see the moon? You see the stars? How about those trees out there? God is speaking to you saying, I did this. You know, the vastness of the universe. So God has made it evident to them by making it evident within them. God has hardwired on our heart an understanding that there is a God. Now, we'll get to this in a minute, but you cannot go to any place on earth and find a nation that doesn't worship something. Hardwired into us is this deep desire to find purpose, meaning, value, truth, beauty. Ultimately, we wrap all that up into one thing. We want something greater than ourselves to worship. You go to the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa, you the farthest reaches of India, if you go up to the North Pole or the South Pole and you find people there, guess what? They're worshiping something. And it's because God has hardwired it inside of us. But the problem is, we suppress that knowledge, and we're going to see this in a minute, we suppress that knowledge and say, no, there is no creator God. Um, rocks made everything. The sun made everything. Alligators made everything. Whatever it is, we choose to worship something other than the creator God. What other truth are they suppressing? We can know things about God by what we see. Now, I want you to hear what Paul is saying under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. This is God speaking. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, the things that make him who he is, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made and, and, and it makes sense, right? Everybody's looking for this transcendent, all-powerful, all-knowing God that they can worship. And God's like, I'm already here. You don't have to make anything up. If we just look out at the world and you think about what it would take to create something like this, you know, not random chance, 
you know, not, uh, you know, natural selection, not, you know, it doesn't evolve over a long period of time. Everything that you see is intricately designed, right? And so God has revealed himself. He's spoken to us and we can know things about him when we look at creation, that he's powerful, that he's divine. And so we see that in his creation. Now, um, and God is cruelly, we'll see, sorry. There we go. Here's a great question. How would you suppress this truth? If God's revealing his wrath against unrighteousness and ungodliness because people are suppressing the truth of him, you know, they're keeping that truth hidden or they're, or they're restraining it or they're not listening to it, how would you do that? How would you suppress that truth? If it's clearly seen in creation, how do you keep yourself and other people from understanding there's a God? How would you suppress it? What would you do? Yeah. Yeah, alternate worldviews. Remember, we talked about the worldview problem. Everybody has presuppositions. So if you start and say, there is no God, even though I clearly see that there's this divine power and this eternal being who's created all this intelligently and it's intricate and amazing, like I can't get past that. But how would you suppress it? Well, we look at alternate worldviews. How about this one? We don't need God. We've got science. God, God can explain, you know, we may say that there's a God of the gaps or maybe there was a God who wound everything up, but he's not personal, you know, he's not a personal creator, but so we don't need an, you know, we don't need God to explain the universe or understand the universe. We've got science. Well, and, and here we go. Stephen Hawking, uh, who recently passed away and is kind of science, you know, his, he's the giant mind of science. That's what he says. Before we understood science, it was natural to believe that God created the universe, but now science offers a more convincing explanation. Now, here's the thing. I want, I want you to hear me say this. I'm not anti-science. I think science is great, um, but I think science needs to be in its right place. You know, science needs to be under the understanding that we can only fully understand the world when we understand that God created it, and because we understand that God has created it, then we can start seeing these things in the world. There's a guy named Johann Kepler. He was a contemporary of, of Galileo. And Kepler, basically, he was a scientist. And here's this thing. The reason I can do science is because I know there's a God who has a constant world that doesn't change, that I can observe. And he says this phrase, and I love this, we need to think God's thoughts after him. And so I'm not anti-science, but here's the problem. If we need to suppress the idea that there is a God and he's created and it's clear, we've got to have another explanation. And this is their explanation. That back when we didn't understand anything, we needed to believe in God. But now that we understand all this stuff about the universe, we don't need God anymore. We have science. And he's not as smart as he thinks he is. The, the, the unfortunate reality about science is, is that they're constantly discovering new stuff that changes all the beliefs that they've had before. Joel. When I was in school studying science in my first degree, science had to be demonstrated and repeated and measured. Right. They have done away with that. Right. So science convinces no one of anything. Right. Except the people who want to be convinced by science. Correct, because it's a worldview. A worldview with presuppositions that everything that we see, and we'll get to this in a minute, but everything that we see wasn't created, it appeared, Right. So that's one way, is that we, we say, we don't need God, we've got science. Or how about this one? This is another great one. All religions are the same. Now, they would take what I had said, that everybody worships, and that's true, everybody worships. But here's what they'll say, all religions are the same. They're basically the same, right? Um, they just call the God something different, but it's the same kind of deal. Yeah. And this may surprise you, but this comes from Muhammad Ali. He says, rivers, ponds, lakes, and streams, they all have different names, but they all contain water, just as religions do. They all contain truths. I wonder why he changes from one to another if they're all the same. Because it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. But there's something important in there I want you to see. He adds a S on truths. Truth isn't plural. That defeats the whole purpose. Truth is, truth is either the truth or it's not the truth, Right? Um, you can't have lots of things that are true. You can't, um, you know, when I was in school, um, I could not say that two plus two equal 12. 
Well, you could, but your teacher wouldn't let you. Exactly. I mean, that, that may have been my truth, but that wasn't the truth, right? And so that's one of the things. That's how we suppress this. We, we say, well, no, everything's all the same, right? Or how about this one? Um, atheism is the only true position that we can take. We don't, have enough, we don't have enough facts to believe that there is a God. So if you have faith, it's blind faith. You're taking a leap. Um, agnosticism, where you don't really know, isn't a good position because, again, you don't have any facts. So atheism is really the only the thinking man's position. Ernest Hemingway says, all thinking men are atheists. Or how about this one um, from Richard Dawkins? We're all atheists about most of the gods humanity has ever believed in. Some of us just go one god further. So do you see the point that I'm making here is that to suppress the truth, you have to come up with alternate explanations, an alternate worldview to understand how we got here, why we got here, what we're doing here, what our purpose is. And there's, these are just three options. I can give you a ton more options that people put out there um, other than God. Because they're afraid to admit that there's a higher power, sure. God, and they can't come to grips with it. Sure. So they're cowards. They can't well, make a decision. Right. Well, and Richard Dawkins, I, I, I have to tell you, you know, he, he's uh, one of those guys that you really can, you know, um, kind of rail against. I, I, I watched him talk about intelligent design where, you know, you can see the way the world was created, the human body, the DNA strand, all this kind of stuff that, that you cannot explain any other way than someone designed it. And here's what he says. The only intelligent design that I would be willing to believe in is that there's aliens out there somewhere that evolved and they evolved to a higher you know, plane than what we have been. And they've come to our solar system and seeded our planet with life. And that's what happened. Right? Where did they come from? Well, they evolved, you know? Yeah. So, yes, sir. Yeah. You believe he's more prone to have to believe in aliens versus God. Right. And so, again, they're, they're trying to take a worldview to answer all these questions that they can't answer. Uh, and they will tell you. They will tell you they don't know where we came from. They don't know why the world was created. They don't understand all that kind of stuff. But they have to have answers, and that's what they do. Cipriano, were you going to say something? He also said that, how do you say it? No, nothing created something. Right. Nothing created something. How yeah. nothing created something? So here's the problem, is that a belief in God is necessary to understand the world as it is because God created the world. God's revealed himself to us in the world. And if you remove that component out, now you've got to put something else in its place. And remember what we talked about with Chesterton? When people stop believing in God, it's not that they don't believe in nothing. They're open to believe in anything, right? That's kind of where we are. So what happens here is, is that God says, listen, they are without excuse. Look at what it says here. Uh, verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So this is a scary thing here. Um, it's, a, it's a scary thing, but also it's something that we need to address because here's what people will say. Okay, if there is a God, he seems to be hiding himself. He's not revealing himself to anybody. And, and it really seems awful that you have these people who live in Africa who are never going to have the Bible. They probably are never going to get a missionary. And God's going to send them to hell, and that's unfair. And yet what we have right here says they are without excuse. I want you to kind of just dig in on that for a second. Every person on the face of this planet is without excuse to know that there is a God. They're without excuse to know that this God is divine, he's eternal, and he's powerful. They're without excuse to know that he created all of these things. It's within their heart. Their desire is to worship something. And God has asked them to, 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 to search out for him. He's not hiding. It's not, you know, it's not like he's you know, just kind of pulled curtains. I mean, he's everywhere. You see him every moment of the day. But here's the thing. They're without excuse, even those who don't know or believe. Yeah. Yes, Heather. Well, and I think that we can see this happening even today. Like in Muslim countries, 
you know, where people have not heard of Christ and they they see the things that God is doing and they turn to him without anyone telling them and they're being saved and they're having visions, they're having God speak to them and they're coming to a knowledge of the truth, the true God, not Muhammad, because God is reaching out to them. And yeah. and that's to me that's evidence that God does what he says in his word. Yeah. You know? He leaves us without excuse. He is speaking to us. Okay. Um, doesn't the word Bible mean book? Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking every time you say truth, this could be named the truth. Yeah. And, and to call it the truth instead of the Bible. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, the Bible is the truth because it reveals the truth about who God is and what God desires. Yeah. John? I find a direct correlation. <coughs> you said he told his disciples, go forth, spread the word. Well, that's what we're doing in Africa. That's yeah. what we're doing with our the missionaries. There's a reason why they're there. And sure. It's because God said, go forth. He did. And But here's the thing that we need to understand. Even, even if that wasn't happening, and I'm thankful that it is, and we need more people to go, here's the thing. God has not left himself without a witness. Okay? And let's talk about how he can stay there without excuse. Here's one of the reasons. They know there is a God because God's revealed himself. Now, we don't have time to read this, but I've given you this. Um, reference for you to go home and look it up. It's beautiful. In Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, basically the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day and night after night, God is speaking to the world by his creation. Every time the sun comes up, God is speaking. Every time it goes down, he's speaking. Every time the moon and the stars are there, he's speaking. Every time the wind blows or we see a river or a bird or a baby, any of that, God is clearly speaking. And he's speaking in every language everywhere, Right? So one of the reasons that people are without excuse is, is that we know there is a God. We see it. We feel it. We experience it by being in his world and his universe and his creation. And we talked about that. You find worship everywhere. That's why there is worship everywhere. God is speaking everywhere. The problem is, is that, listen to what they do. Verse 21, even though they knew God, they don't honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they become futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts are darkened. Professing to be wise, they become fools. They exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for idols. So what happens is the reason that they don't have an excuse is they choose not to honor God or to give him thanks. And I think we need to key in on that little word, choose. And, and this is the thing that uh, it's so difficult for us to kind of work through with people who don't under, have our worldview and our presuppositions. Um, Richard Dawkins being one of those, he would say, the only reason you're a Christian is because you live in America. Christianity is the predominant religion in America. In most places, people are Christian, and you grew up in a Christian home, and that's why you're a Christian. It's cultural. If you had lived in Scandinavia or Norway, you would believe in Thor and Odin and all the Viking gods. And if you live somewhere else, you'd believe something else right? And, and so that's the thing. They, they just kind of think that this is like a cultural deal that you just kind of grow up with and not something that you clearly see through creation and your mind's been changed, right? Yes, sir. Said though, he's talking about there can be no atheists because they right. make knowledge their God. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great thing. And I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. I do believe there is no such thing as an atheist. Um, they've just, they have just substituted their non-belief for belief. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, if you want to make an atheist mad, tell them that their religion is atheism. And, and they will freak out on you. I was talking to a guy, he said, I don't believe in God. And I said, it's strange, you're talking about it on your National Atheist Day. Right, April Fool's Day. <laughs> yeah. so, so, and, but, the, but the problem is, is that just like with science or with philosophy or with idolatry, atheism is just another way to worship who you want being yourself right? Um, and so they're without excuse because God reveals this to them and they choose not to honor him and they choose not to give him thanks. And what happens is they become futile in their speculations. They're looking for answers in all the wrong places. And, and it's sad that word futility means, you know, it's, that, it's kind of the definition of insanity. You keep doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results, right? That's insanity, you know? I keep running into the wall. I keep banging my head into the wall and my headache won't go away duh, you know? And then that's what happens. They, they are looking for answers in all the wrong places. And so instead of stopping, 
being overwhelmed and awed by the creation, and they step back and go, wait, okay, there's got to be somebody outside of me. There's got to be somebody bigger than me. There's got to be somebody bigger than this alligator that we've been worshiping or this rock or this statue that has created everything. And if there is, I want you to, to speak to me and reveal yourself to me, right? That, that's a great way to pursue an answer because he will. God will reveal himself to you. He will speak to you. But instead, what they do is they look for answers in all the wrong places. They look for them inside themselves. They look for it in knowledge or they look for it in, you know, uh, lifestyles and different things and, and identities and stuff like that. And so they become futile. They, they're, they say they're chasing after God, but they're running in the wrong direction. And then he says, their foolish heart was darkened. They are blinded to God's revelation. And, you know, one of the things that makes me sad is one of the arguments that we see all the time about, you know, the support of evolution is, well, look, you know, you have this kind of bird and it has, you know, it's evolved to be in its, you know, surroundings. Okay, here's the thing. It may have adapted to the surroundings that it's in, but it didn't change from being a bird. It's still a bird. It didn't go from being a horse to a bird or a bird to an alligator. That would be evolution. And they, they deny the clear, the clear sense of what design really is. Uh, there's an argument that people make that, you know, that nothing created something, that all of this just appeared, and over a period of time it grew. Now, you know, we've been out here long enough to experience some New Mexico winds, and, you know, they're pretty powerful, Right. But, but if, I had, if I didn't know anything about God or I had, had no understanding of who God is, if I was driving through New Mexico and we had just experienced the wind that we did a few weeks ago, I wouldn't stop and say, wow, that wind is so powerful it made this building. <laughs> it just blew all this stuff together and here it is. Like over a period of time, the wind kept blowing and the foundation happened and the wind kept blowing and walls came up and the wind kept blowing and carpet laid down and the wind kept blowing and there's a roof on this place and wind kept blowing and there's electricity. <laughs> they, they just deny the clear understanding of, of creation and design. And so what happens, their foolish heart gets darkened and they cannot see the clear picture of God's hand everywhere and God revealing himself everywhere. They're without excuse. Well, let me, let me share this with you. This is a guy, he's a scientist, he's a biologist. His name is Francis Crick, and he says, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. And you say, well, what's the big deal with that? What is he saying? Everything shows design, but you cannot say that it's designed. You have to say that it's evolved. I learned as science. Sure. Because the scientific you're method, yeah. You're, you're, you're observing something to find out the truth of it. Sure. Not preconceived through truth, but right. finding out what... But that's why this is important. When you pull God and the understanding of God out, it messes everything up. You know, when you pull God out and you look at the creation and you say, man, it's clearly designed... It's clearly designed, and I, I could bore you with a lot of things about the distance that the earth is from the moon to the sun, and if we were any, just this tiny, minuscule, you know, difference closer or further away, how we'd either burn up or we'd freeze, you know, the, the axis is tilted at the right angle, and if we were a half degree either way, we would spin out into the solar system, or again, we wouldn't get enough sun or, you know, all this kind of stuff, and, you know, the, the, the oxygen that we, had, that we breathe in the earth is, is so precise that you have to replicate it in a laboratory, did you know that? Like, it is so precise that it can only be replicated in a laboratory. And so there's all these things, but here's the thing. You know, our foolish hearts get dark, and when we pull God out of the equation, how do we explain design? How do we explain that? We have to come up with something else. And then here's the thing that's really difficult. Verse 23, they exchanged the glory of God for a lie. And, and, and that's the scariest thing. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And here's the lie that they exchanged for the truth. There is no God who created or revealed himself. The universe is an accident. It happened by chance. There is no meaning. There is no purpose. Um, C.S. Lewis said one time, and I really thought this was great. He said, atheists have a really big problem because if they believe that the universe has no value and no meaning and no purpose, we should, we should have never figured that out. But the fact that we can figure out 
that the, the universe has purpose and value and meaning, but we don't know what that is, that's a problem, right? We should have never figured out that this was all a mistake. This was all by chance. So they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Nature is all there is. Here's another way they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Nature is all there is, all there was, and all there ever will be. Now, one of the things, and, and I want to share this with you because it's really important. For a long time, Christians were really scared of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, I remember hearing that, and people would just freak out when you talked about the Big Bang Theory. Actually, that has become one of the greatest scientific, scientific discoveries <clears throat> that the universe is not um, eternal, that it hasn't always existed, that with the Hubble telescope and some other things we found, we found the place where all of a sudden there's like, here's the universe back here, and there was nothing out before that. And you say, why is that important? Because it, undo, it undoes all the theories that they've had about how the earth began. And there's a guy, his name is Robert Jastrow. He uh, worked on the Apollo missions for NASA. He's not a Christian. But here's what he says. The discovery of the Big Bang Theory is the nail in the coffin to atheism and evolution. He said, because now we have to answer, how did something come out of nothing? nothing there's nothing to bang you know? And, and so this is an amazing deal, and we shouldn't be scared of that. But here's the thing. Now what you're going to hear is people talk about that the universe has always existed. It's eternal. Or we're part of this multiverse, and the multiverse has bled over into our dimension, and that's why stuff happened. Here's the thing. They realized, they've recognized, they had this theory, oh, it was a big bang. It just all happened at once. You're right, it did. God spoke and bang, it was. <laughs> but now there's a problem, right? Or how about this? They exchange the truth of God for a lie that we should worship nature, creatures, and humans because that's all there is. So I talked about this a little bit on Sunday, and I think it bears repeating. Worldviews have consequences. What we believe, why we believe it, and how we live it out has consequences. And the consequence when we pull God out of our worldview, we pull God out of our understanding of the world, God's wrath is revealed to us. Look at verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That, that's an answer to a lot of questions, but I want to tell you it's an answer to one specific question. When people say, why is there evil and suffering and pain and death in this world? And why, and why is God allowing it to happen? You just go to verse 18 and say, look, God's wrath is being revealed against all this unrighteousness and evil and pain because people, us, are suppressing the hope, suppressing the peace, and suppressing the answer to the problem. So worldviews have consequences. And here's one of the consequences that it has. Foolishness masquerades as wisdom. Foolishness masquerades as wisdom. Verse 22, he says, professing to be wise, they became fools. Verse 24, um, God gave them over in the lust of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. They have exchanged the natural use of their body for unnatural uses. Foolishness masquerades as wisdom. They accept and celebrate all forms of idolatry. This is a great quote by Robbie Zacharias, and I want to share it with you because it's important. So when, when people talk about Christianity being exclusive, um, that, you know, well, there's only one way, there's only one salvation, there's only one truth, and, and they say, well, listen, you can't be exclusive. What about all these other religions? You do realize every religion is exclusive in some way. Listen to what he says. All religions are not the same. All religions do not point to God. All religions do not say that all religions are the same. They don't say that. In fact, at the heart of every religion is an uncompromising commitment to a particular way of defining who God is or is not, and accordingly of defining life's purpose. Every religion at its core is exclusive. Does that make sense? So here's what's happening. This foolishness that masquerades as wisdom says, listen, accept everything. It's all the same. It doesn't matter. Do what you want. Live what you want. Believe what you want. It doesn't matter. And Paul is saying, no. No, it does matter because every religion is exclusive. And here's one of the ways they're exclusive. They say you can believe anything you want, 
Just don't claim it to be the truth. Betty. One thing that I love about Christianity, it is exclusive, but it can be all-inclusive. Yes. Whosoever will may come. And to me, that's a great point to point out to people is, you know. Yeah. That's right. But, but here's the, uh, and you're so right, and here's the thing. This is the exclusivity these other religions have. You can believe whatever you want, just as long as you don't claim it to be the one and only truth. Or how about this? You can live however you want. You can do what you want. You can use your body any way you want. Just don't judge anybody else. Don't say, that's right, and that's wrong. Once you use those two terms, you're out. And this is my favorite one. You can worship whatever you want and whomever you want and wherever you want. Just don't claim Jesus as the Lord and Savior. I know, but I'm not, that's not my belief. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. But, but, that's, but that's the problem that we have is they accept and celebrate all forms of idolatry except the truth. And that's this foolishness masquerading as wisdom. They reject and persecute anything that points to God. You're too exclusive. You're bigoted. Uh, you're narrow-minded. Uh, your, your truth is too difficult. Uh, another great quote that G.K. Chesterton said is that uh, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been, it has been found difficult and left untried. So that's the thing that a lot of people come to is that they, it's not that they try Christianity and say it doesn't work. What happens is they start hearing the truth and God says, this is the standard and this is how I want you to live and these are the things that I want you to do. And they go, that's too hard. I'm not doing that. So it's not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. So they reject and persecute anything that points to God. And then here's the thing. This is when worldviews have consequences. God gives them over to their deepest and darkest desires. I think, I think this is the thing that scares me about this. And this is what happens fundamentally when you pull God out, remove him as the fundamental starting place for all of creation and humanity and meaning and purpose and value and truth. When you pull him out and you say, this is what I want. I don't want to worship you. I want to be a fool. I want to just, you know, continue to darken my heart. Here's what God says. God gives you over. Verse 24, God gave them over to the lust of their heart. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Verse 25. Verse 26, God gave them over. Verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. Other religions, especially the ones that come up with their own gods, like Vikings and stuff, none of those gods hold them accountable for their sin. Sure. They don't convict them. It's all about partying. When we go to Valhalla, we're going to drink with the gods. It's not about a personal relationship, and it's not about being convicted. Yeah. And I think maybe that's, they're scared of God's wrath because they know that they're sinning, so they try to make something to where it makes it happy for them. It's a happy thing. Right. I agree with that 100%. And, th and this is the scary part, and this is what we need to hold on to and our understanding of this and why this is important and, and how we you know, share with people and try to draw them in, we, we need to understand that, that the scary part of this is that God's going to give them over to what they want. And they don't have any clue what they want or what they need, but they're railing against God saying, I don't want you. I don't want to believe in you. I'm scared of what you're going to do. So I want to create my own ideas, my own religion, my own way to life. And then God says, okay, I'm going to give you over. God's wrath is letting you fall into foolishness and darken your heart. If, if that's what you choose to believe, go ahead. He's revealed himself. He's given us the prophets. He's given us, you know, the Bible. He's given us churches and preachers. He's given us Jesus, his son. He's given us everything that we need to believe in him. But if you say no, he's going to let you do that. God's wrath is letting you dishonor your body with immorality. I mean, it talks about here that they dishonor themselves. Verse 24, he says, God gave them over to the lust of their heart, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. That's a scary deal. God's wrath is letting you exchange the truth for a lie. God's wrath is letting you pursue passions that are unnatural. God's wrath is letting you think that evil is good and good is evil. Look at verse 28. 
Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Does that seem to fit in the list that we've been talking about? Without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Now here it is. Although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. So God's wrath is letting you think evil is good and good is evil, knowing that what you're doing deserves death, you do it anyway. And knowing that what you do deserves death, you approve of it and encourage others to take part in it with you. Now he talks about here um, in verse 27 about them receiving the due penalty of their error. It's reaping what they sow. Now, and I've heard a lot of messages about this, and they really hammer on the part about homosexuality. And I want you to understand that that is really not the point of the passage. The point of this passage is that once you take God fundamentally out of the description of life, you are open to believe anything and do anything. And in fact, you can go so far as to begin to, to believe and desire and want things that are completely unnatural. And that's the point. And, and so we, we kind of hammer on this and, you know, people talk about how it's the unforgivable sin and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that's really not the point of what this is. The point of what he's saying is the due penalty of your error is reaping what you're sowing. See, the scary thing is, is, you know, that these people are never going to wake up. They're never going to see the truth that's out there, that God exists, that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, and that God wants to transform them. Their eyes are going to be blinded by Satan, and they're going to receive the due penalty that they've created for themselves, that they're going to reap what they've sown. Yeah? One of the amazements of my life as I get older is to see the deepest, darkest inhumanity of humanity. Yeah. It is. It is. And so the due penalty of their error is reaping what they've sowed. And here's the thing. They're without excuse. We need to take this seriously. You know, this isn't one of those clobber passages where we go and clobber people over the head. Really, this is one of those things that should break our heart. And those people who have put something else as the center of their worldview, as the, the rock that they build their life on, we, we got to go and help them sh and show them, hey, that, that's, not, that's not the answer. And if you continue in this lifestyle and you continue down this path, you're going to reap what you've sown. Um, in the next, actually, we can just look at it. Look, look down in Romans chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. You've heard me quote this a lot of times, but I want you to see it in God's word. Verse 4, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. See, the whole point that Paul's making here is this, is that God wants you to turn. It's God's kindness that he reveals himself to us. It's God's kindness that he's helped us understand. He's just painted it everywhere that he's there, that he loves us, that Jesus died for us. And when we choose to remove him from the equation, we're going to reap what we are sowing. And so... When we, when we talk to people about that and they say it's unjust for God to send people to hell, God doesn't send people to hell. Amen. You choose it. And they say it's unjust to be punished for something done on the earth and to be punished for it eternally. Well, here's the problem. God is just giving you what you've sown. You have stored up for yourself all this wrath and all this judgment. And what you get when you go to hell, when you are separated from God, is what you've wanted and what you've created. I mean, really let that sink in. You create hell for yourself. So this is something that we need to take seriously. And their due penalty, they're destroying their lives and their eternities. So as we look at this and as, we're, as we work through this idea of renewing our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we need to understand that we can never be the people that God's created us to be until God is the center of our worldview. So God is the, the presupposition. We believe that there is a God. He's revealed himself. The Bible is true. Jesus is his Christ. I mean, you know, we have to have these fundamental things to begin to understand God's word and allow that to transform us from the inside out.
So any questions about that tonight? I hope I haven't confused you too much or bored you to death. So any questions or comments before we go? So were the days of Noah. Yeah, very much so. And then judges. All right, well, let's... Per you said that uh, Ernest Hemingway was uh, an atheist, and how did he end his life? Yeah. Yeah, suicide. Yeah. When we remove, when we remove the giver of hope and peace, there is no hope to be in peace to be found. So, all right, let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Thank you guys for being here tonight, Father. We just thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you for the truth of your word. Um, help it to sink into us to understand these other worldviews, these competing ideas, and how that, 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 that this is being used to suppress your truth. And God, man, we'd be people of the light to go out and share what we know to be true, to share it in a way that is uh, caring and loving, and God, that we want them to come to, to faith in you, not to, as a hammer to just beat them over the head. And so, Father, I just pray that, that we would be more convinced of the necessity of, of you, that we would be more convinced that you are the foundation for all our beliefs, that we would become more convinced of what you believe and why you believe it and begin to live that way. And God, we would be convinced that if we don't go and share, there are going to be people who will never hear the wonderful words. God's demonstrated his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So Father, I just... Pray for my brothers and sisters that you would help us as we go our separate ways. Bless us and use us. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed. We'll see you again on Sunday morning.